There we go. Hi, and welcome back uh, to our final event for today under the Transforming Education Pillar of uh, Penn State Startup Week. We've had a, a great day so far. We've kind of been scaffolding, we've kind of been walking our way through events today where we started off this morning with Darren Coudray talking about opportunities in EdTech. So if you don't have an idea, what are the opportunities? Where can you go? How can you start? Then we passed along to Lee Erickson who started talking about, okay, now, now you've started. What minefield? How do you navigate the minefield? What, what do you avoid? What are some common mistakes that you can learn from? Then we made our way to Herbert who t uh, in the last session who talked about, all right, you've got an idea. You've gotten started. Now, how do you convince other people that that idea is a great idea? Now what we're going to do is we are lucky enough to have a panel with us of entrepreneurs that are going to be able to talk about their experiences. So one of the last barriers to doing this, to being an entrepreneur, is understanding that you can do it, that this is something that is within your grasp. You've seen the Startup Week posters where they have the excuses with a big red slash through it that says, get started. And that's what this session is about today. Our moderator today is Melissa Shipke. She is the uh, CEO and founder of Tassel, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about her. Uh, Melissa has been uh, named on multiple 40 under 40 lists, 30 under 30, 30, un, uh, 30 entrepreneurs under 30 lists. If there's a 10 under 10 list, I'm sure she was on it. <laughs> She's been on a bunch of those types of lists because of the approach that she has taken, the idea that she's had, and more importantly, the passion and drive she has had in, a, in a, trying to attain her goal for her business. Um, I remember m meeting Melissa at, a, at a, a conference about a year and a half, two years ago, and uh, something that we talked about stuck in my mind. She, she was, we were talking about connections and, and making connections with people. And she said, you know, with businesses, it's, it's not about what you ask of other people. It's, it's about how you connect with them. It's about the people you reach out to. It's about the people you connect. And that's what her tool does, but it's also what we're trying to do. It's part of what Startup Week is all about. So today, we're lucky enough to have a panel of guests, and they'll all, they'll all introduce themselves as we go along. Uh, we'll have a panel of guests that are gonna be able to tell you about their stories, their inspiration, where they are and how they got there and help you understand that you can get there too if it's something you're interested in. So please help me welcome our panel and Melissa. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to be back here on campus for Startup Week. Uh, excited to talk to all these guys who, I, who I've met a couple of times down at the launch box and some other Penn State entrepreneur related activities. Um, to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a 2009 graduate of the Smeal College of Business. I graduated with a degree in marketing. I also graduated from the College of Comm the same year with a degree in advertising um, and immediately stayed involved uh, as an alumni. Um, I was a volunteer on the alumni board for the Smeal College of Business, so was fortunate enough to come back to campus twice a year to, to work on different engagement strategies with uh, that college, where I first identified some of the opportunities that I ended up turning into a business of my own. Um, I did have a full-time job that I was working in uh, after graduating um, in marketing and sales, uh, where I stayed for about five years before making the, the leap to become an entrepreneur and, and start my own company. Uh, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur until I actually made that leap and uh, I think quickly learned what an entrepreneur really, really meant. Um, but the idea was really born actually right here on campus in one of those meetings where I just had that light bulb moment of there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, and the better solution we were trying to solve to, to a big problem was how do we connect and engage with alumni outside of just asking them for money and contributing financially? How do we look at engagement differently, figure out the needs of our alumni and keep them connected to the community in a way that they get continuous value from their education for years past graduating and students continue to get the value of the growth of that network and the people that are involved in that network. Um, so we wanted to take a look at that ecosystem and really understand what the different problems were, uh, what are the problems alumni were having, what were the problems that the volunteer <laughs> leaders who are not paid by the university but uh, continue to stay engaged and engage others in different markets, and then what were the problems that the university was having that made it uh, difficult to look at engagement and really understand what the needs were. And a lot of that had to do with how we connect and the technologies that we connect. 
So I quit my job and started a company with a friend at the time. There was just two of us. Uh, we bootstrapped for the first year and a half um, where we were hustling real hard, uh, working really long hours, working part-time gigs, um, doing some, I did some marketing on the side for some small businesses. Uh, and we started building technology that would help connect alumni back to the ecosystem, help volunteer leaders connect their events and resources down to alumni, and help the university better measure things that aren't as easily measurable. So how often you're coming back to campus, uh, how frequently you need career service support, how um, often you are getting engaged with the local chapters and the different markets. Uh, so it's been an amazing journey. We got funded about uh, a year and a half into it for our first round of funding. Um, we're uh, continuing to raise funds now and expanding into doing things with student engagement, which has been a really fun time as well. Um, and uh, it's just been an amazing experience. And we've been really fortunate to get to work with schools like Penn State and other schools across the US who are really thinking about what are ways we can continually add value back to our alumni base for the years that they're off campus. So excited today to talk uh, with this, these guys here. I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves and then we'll jump into some questions about how you go from having an idea to actually starting that. Cool, well, my name is Andrew Simpson and I'm the... Oh, there we go, now you can hear me better. <laughs> well, my name is Andrew Simpson. I am actually running a tech company despite the fact that I didn't even realize this mic wasn't on. Um, but yeah, so I didn't realize that, I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was until my junior year of college, which is actually pretty weird. So I always had entrepreneurial tendencies, but I didn't know what an entrepreneur was. I always aspired to be a lawyer. That was my goal all the way up to college and close to graduation. And I did notice that I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I was a little bit younger, but I didn't know that there was a word that described what I wanted to do, where I, after Halloween, I got a bunch of the old dumb, dumb lollipops that my mom didn't get rid of, and I started selling them at school and I started ripping people off by charging them uh, $3 for a dum-dum, and people really, st I'm not gonna say they're stupid, but they didn't realize, I guess, the supply and demand, I, I had a lot of leverage there, and I ended up making a lot of money, and fast forward to college, I made it to my senior year, I had two, I was in my last year, and I had one semester left, but I couldn't afford to uh, continue going through, because I was out of state, and so I ended up taking time off because I just couldn't afford it. I couldn't even afford to get my grades. And I was at a place where I was just like lost for a short period of time. And I ended up taking a year and a half off just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life and find direction. And through that time, I went to this event called Three Day Startup where I met Kenny, my co-founder, and we were working on another project. It didn't really work out too well, but we decided that we wanted to keep pushing and actually create a company. And I went to the point where I didn't think I could create a company. I didn't think I could do anything besides just watch Shark Tank. And nothing really felt real until I graduated and started working full time. So after that time of building a company, not really knowing anything about how to build an app, and to building a team, and then getting to the point where we are now, where I've been working full time after graduating from January 1st, 2017, to actually raising money at this point, it's just an amazing journey for us. And going from not knowing what you wanna to do to not knowing how you're gonna become an entrepreneur and create a business to actually raising capital in three months, it's a really huge and humbling experience for us. So I'm Kenny Dundorf and uh, my journey also starts from my junior year, but junior year of high school. And that's kind of when uh, you know I was looking at colleges, I started to look introspectively of what I wanna be and what I really wanna do. And I started asking myself these questions, and as I looked around me, I knew that I didn't want the same path as many of those people who surrounded me, my parents, my teachers, etc. But those who excited me were these entrepreneurs, and that's kind of what I figured out I really wanted to do. So going into my junior year of high school, that summer I kind of dedicated myself to jumping into books, to videos, and looking at those who have gone to the place I wanted to be and then learning from them and starting to build a mindset. And then going into college, I kind of knew I didn't want to go to college just to get my degree and then graduate and get a corporate job. I wanted to come out of it with a company, with a co-founder. And that was kind of my mindset going in. Um, and I, I came in a, as a dual major in engineering and business because that combines the business side of things with something technical. So it was kind of the best of both worlds for me, and I thought that was a good track. I then found out that's impossible to do because they're enrollment controlled. 
So that was kind of a cur curveball to me, and that led me to IST, which was kind of a great stepping stone for me and a great intermediary point because it does tie business and um, you know a technical field together. So throughout the whole process of studying, I always kind of was looking for an idea as well as a group of people to work with. And as Andrew said, we met at the program called Three Day Startup, um, and we met at this mixer, and I saw Andrew there, and the entire room gravitated around him. And from that moment on, I knew that's somebody I want to work with. So really identifying that person was a huge step in my journey. Um, and from that point on, we really have been, have been running with someone new and have been pouring kind of all of our time and effort into it and have hit some good milestones. And um, it's, it's been a great ride so far, and we, we look forward to the future. Okay. Hi, guys. So I'm Rhea Batia. I'm currently a senior, graduating soon. But um, so basically, I don't think my journey really started in high school or even really college until, I guess, last this summer when we started our company. Um, we kind of just fell into it. I think Elaine's been the person that's always wanted to make an impact, and she's always wanted to be that person that, like, changes things and starts her own thing. But I was really never almost like that. But I always loved technology. So what ended up happening was this summer we were talking about all this technology and how it's going to change the future. And then we kind of fell into this idea of what if we use technology to change the future? What if we actually do it? Um, and we fell into some different places. We started in health a little bit. We looked around into education. And then we landed on educational technology because we wanted to, we're right here in education right now. So why don't we start here and see where we can go? Um, but yeah. So I'm Elaine Demopoulos. I'm also the co-founder of Rain Reality. Um, so basically how Rhea and I know each other is we were in the same sorority, um, an engineering science sorority, and we're best friends. And we talked all the time that past summer, and we just started brainstorming about um, augmented reality and virtual reality and how amazing it is and how transformative. And once you do it one time, it does not leave your head. You're like, wow, I can't imagine doing anything different. Um, so we really liked the technology. We didn't have a purpose. So that was kind of different about us, is people mostly identify a problem and then go towards a solution. We identified the solution and then tried to figure out how it could solve problems. So we knew that augmented reality and virtual reality were the future, and we explored different spaces. Like Rhea said, we went into health. We went into uh, education, specifically universities. We went into uh, uh, even uh, long-term care centers, all these different things. But then we realized we're students, we're experts in education because we've been students all of our lives, and that's really helped us define problems that we, like we've identified problems in education ourselves. And um, we've formed Rain Reality, which is an ed tech startup that changes education with augmented reality. Um, we believe that augmented reality is technology that will take us all forward, so. Uh, my name is Joseph Katunga. I'm the founder of What's Poppin'. Uh, and what we do is basically we help you share and discover events that are going on around campus. Uh, but my story is a, is a little bit different because I, uh, I didn't start out to found a startup or even to, to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I just wanted to build something because I'm a computer engineer, so I wanted to build something so that um, I could kind of show people, you know, and be proud of it. But I realized once I started building uh, last summer, my f freshman, y my freshman summer into sophomore year, I realized that, like, I'd built it, but like it was just sitting in my computer and no one else was using it, and so it was kind of useless because the only person who would know like that I built it was was just me, and it was just something for my resume. But um, I'd always wanted to make more of a of an impact in society, so. Uh, I figured why not try to use the technology that I was I was learning how to build to to try and make a difference and so that's how what's popping started uh, as a freshman the biggest challenge that I had was finding events that were going on around campus I mean it wasn't for a lack of trying there were tons of events that were happening but um, the biggest challenge was just there wasn't a central place or even um, several different places where I could go find like just events that were uh, that fit my interest. So What's Poppin' kind of fits that mold where you could go on What's Poppin', enter your interests, and discover events based on that uh, and those interests. But once I started uh, focusing more on the 
I guess, business side of things and, and not just the technology, I realized that it was, it was much harder to sell something than it is to build it. Uh, but because of the team that, uh, like, other people joined me. I don't know why, but they, they, they joined me. So <laughs> we, we built a team that's really passionate about what we're doing. And uh, I think, I mean, we're at, at the absolute beginning. So uh, I guess take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt because I still have no idea what I'm doing. But I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. But uh, ultimately, there's nothing that I, c throughout this journey, I've learned so much that I don't think I would have learned in school or um, anywhere else, not on the internet, but just by doing it and, and putting my heart and soul into it, going in every day, uh, whether it's writing the program or even t sharing what I'm doing with other students so that they can use the platform themselves. Um, we It's the most rewarding thing I've ever done and I hope to continue doing it because uh, technology is not just meant to be built and stashed away, it's meant to I guess solve a real problem, and when you solve that problem, it's it's one of the, the most fulfilling experiences of your life. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for introducing yourselves and sharing us a little bit about the background of your story. I want to start by asking everybody on the panel. I think a, a lot of people out here have different ideas in their heads of, of different <laughs> ways that they uh, want to start a business. What were the first few steps you took after you had that big idea that? that led you down the path of, of starting your business officially? All right, so this is probably, <laughs> I don't know if Elaine wants me to say this, but <laughs> this is a funny story. So um, we were talking about ideas and I had this crazy idea in the summer that I wanted to start my own coffee business on, the, um, on campus and I wanted to sell coffee like to students because I was like, everyone loves Starbucks, but you have to walk to it. So what if it's cold outside? Like. Why don't you just have a coffee business that delivers just like order up? Um, so I was gonna ride my bike around and use the, I guess the energy from my bike to heat up the coffee in the back of my seat. And then I called Penn State and I called the health inspector and everything and they, they laughed at me. There was, they said, if you try and sell on our, our campus, we'll kick you off. And they laughed and I was like, oh, okay. Because you can only sell food that's in the commons and stuff. So I was like, maybe I can do it downtown. And I got in touch with the state college, like health inspector people or someone that would give me a permit for this. Um, so that's how our LLC was created <laughs> the first time. And then we re-LLC'd, I guess, in, however, that in Virginia, but I mean in Pennsylvania. So to reiterate, when you start a business, you need to register with the state. So we decided to form an LLC, which is a type of business. Um, there's also corporations. Um, there's like sole, sole proprietorships and whatnot. But an LLC is a pretty um, common way that startups usually register with the state. Um, and our thing you have to do is register with the government. You need to get your IRS codes. Um, but the cool thing about this is like, there's lots of questions about how do you actually start officially. Um, you don't really need it until you start needing to put money in the bank. Like you don't necessarily need an LLC until you're ready. Um, it was just kind of for us. If it, it made us feel like we're more official. Like we are re in reality LLC. Like that kind of made it more official, but it's not really necessary, I guess. In Virginia, we're still a coffee business, but in Pennsylvania, <laughs> we're, we're something well, else. I think I, I canceled that like last oh, month. That's yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the first steps we took. The next thing we did was we started talking to a lot of people. Um, we really took advantage of Penn State's environment, of all the professors and students around us. So because we were in education specifically, it really helped us to learn about what other professors, professors are doing in the fields of VR and AR. Um, and then we joined Launchbox. So. Uh, it's a basically a boot camp accelerator program. It's a little bit off campus, but it's affiliated with Penn State, and it allows you to really discover who your company is, who your customers are, what problem you're trying to solve, and most importantly, it allows you to meet with a lot of different people that you never would have before. Um, the networking opportunities with Launchbox were fantastic, and I encourage anyone who wants to start an entrepreneurship business at Penn State to run through that program. So I would say uh, if you have an idea, and that's usually where these things start, uh, like uh, you said, you want to go and you want to talk to as many people as possible first. Because at the end of the day, if people don't like the idea you're working on and you're the only one, it doesn't matter. So you need to go out and you need to talk to as many people as you can and really narrow down who your customer is going to be. You find out uh, what target demographic that is, and then you talk to them. If their feedback is, this sucks, then you either scrap the idea or you pivot. 
And the key of starting out is doing that very quickly. So having these hyper cycles of feedback and then pivots and then finding something, uh, finding a solution is the key. Once you kind of have a little bit of direction, you want to make something called an MVP, which is the minimum viable product. So you have your idea, and then you want to turn it into something. So for us, we have this app that took us quite a few months of development. And for most people, we were scrappy, but for most people, it would have been about an $80,000 project. So before you write any code, you want to make sure you have something, and then you want to test it. So for us, before writing that code, we create a simple Weebly page. And we just ask people to do, at the core of someone new, just have conversations with each other. Go to the hub and go um, meet this random person. Uh, will you do this? And remarkably, a lot of people said yes. So we found that we had interest, and that was kind of the starting point, that we built something very quickly, we proved out our products, and then we went to the next step. I just have a very simple answer because these guys hit the nail on the head of stop talking about it, just do it. Honestly, it, there's too many people that ponder and say, hey, mom, I'm thinking about this idea. Hey, friends, I'm thinking of an idea. And they keep telling themselves, and they get this little dopamine release in their brains, and they think that they've done something, and then they watch Shark Tank. They don't do anything at all. Stop talking about it. If you want to start a business, then go out, commit to it, and then start taking action. Because never, you're never going to make a business if you keep thinking through everything. Stop overthinking, just do. Yeah, I think a big piece of feedback and things that we, we see oftentimes from people starting out their companies really uh, in college or even just young entrepreneurs uh, is they're hesitant to want to share their idea because they're worried someone might take it and run with it. It's the biggest mistake you can make as an entrepreneur. Um, as these guys said, you want to find out what your customers want, what do they need. A big part of what we did at Tassel really early on before we even wrote any lines of code is we, we mocked up what it would look like and we took it to people in alumni relations and we took it to schools and we talked to alumni uh, to figure out you know, what, what were the needs that they, that they had. Um, if you start kind of building in your own world and your own idea, you'll take on a lot of technical debt, uh, a lot of actual debt, uh, and you'll end up having to pivot a lot more later on. So you want to make sure you're validating your market, that there's a need for in the market. You need to see how big that market is, so how many people actually have that need, uh, and you need to, to work on and, and hash out all those different pieces of the plan. So the next question we'll ask to the panel is really around um, another fear that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs have around, I don't have the knowledge or of capabilities to run a business. So what were the things that after you started that, that you learned that you're like, man, I never thought I would learn that, or it was a complete kind of shock to you as something that you now know and have knowledge of? Uh, I could go first. <laughs> uh, so for me, it's like, uh, I'm probably the, I'm very introverted, so it's like, uh, I usually, like, I just think a lot in my own time, but having conversations with people wasn't my strong suit necessarily, but once I started um, and I realized that I wanted people to actually use the product, I had to go out to the hub, and uh, it was over the summer. It was actually where I met these guys, <laughs> but over the summer, um, uh, I was here doing research at the Millennium Science Complex, and I just went out after, like, it was very buggy. It was just a website, but I went out, and I tried to get people to use it, so I, I stepped out of my comfort zone, and I just started to get people to see what people would say about it. So I'd get them to sign up for the website, see if they'd come back the next day. For the first version of the website, I talked to 100 people on the first day, and only like 30 people signed up. So like 70 people said no to me, and it, it kind of hurt at the beginning. But I realized that um, not everyone's going to love your product. But even more than that, I, I wanted to learn why they didn't love it so I could reiterate on the on, on what I had, and so co going going into that, uh, like it, it helped us because once we applied to the launch box and got in, we, we had to do that week in and week out, and just the feedback as they were saying earlier from from those in, from those people, like learning why they said no, and then making sure that uh, like I, I don't think you'll ever solve a problem that like well for us for instance, not everyone's ever going to love our our, our our platform, but the people that really need it, the people that um, that usually stay in their dorms, rewatching those shows on Netflix, uh, those we found that those people are, are are who we want to talk to. So we did a survey at the end of the last semester, and and people were like, uh, only ten people replied out of like 
a hundred. But the people that replied said that um, they they went to twelve events throughout the semester. On average, some went to more, but those those people that replied actually took the time out of their days and and went to to an event, which was the ultimate goal, not just having people come to our website then leave after two minutes or thirty seconds, but people actually going to the events. So. Wait, I actually forgot what the question was. <laughs> but uh, what we learned was that, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, throughout the experience, we just learned that, um, like, try to get people to really love you. Like, try to get people to actually, like, try to solve a real problem that people actually have. Because once, once we realized that people were having problems with finding events and that people were actually going to the events that we posted, it was it was almost like a validation of our idea that we weren't just building something that w people would just go to and then leave without ever actually engaging with the events. So that was a really important factor and a big motivation into why we still do what we do. I'm just gonna be really fast. I'm gonna be like a commercial here. Um, same answer as last time. <laughs> Stop overthinking. Just start your business. I mean, if you if I thought about all the stuff that's happened so far. I probably never would have started the company. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, because there's your work. You're gonna people think that they're gonna work a job uh, at a startup and work way less than they normally would and have amazing payoffs, have no boss. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. On all three of those, you're gonna be working way more than you ever have in your entire life, and you're not gonna see the monetary return till five years from now. <laughs> so. Like people think that when a startup raises a million dollars, that the, the the startup CEO is a millionaire. He's not. It's, it's not how it works. So if you want to actually start a business, then maybe talk to sit down and talk to one on one. You could I'm sure anyone up here will be more than happy to talk to you and tell you about kind of the struggles we went through, but actually try to motivate you to get started. Because if you keep thinking about what can go wrong and the the reasons why you shouldn't start a startup, then you're never going to start. So at first, it's very daunting because you know nothing, and you're thrust into this new opportunity. And the, the key, I think, is to ask a lot of questions. And Google can be a great resource. We constantly are Googling things we don't know because the role of an early round uh, founder is almost that of a firefighter. There's all these fires that pop up every day, and you have no clue how to put them out. So you have to find resources that give you those answers and then that information, you know, you retain it, and then you bring it with you. Um, even today, being in this for a bit, we understand that Andrew and myself, in the grand scheme of things, also don't really know anything. Uh, so it's kind of getting to that place of knowing you don't know a lot of these things, but knowing what you don't know. So then you're able to then go seek that knowledge and then learn and progress, and something uh, another entrepreneur said, I'll, I'll steal it from him, Nick Gilson, was it's all about leveling up fast. And I, I really like that. It's almost like a video game. If you really push and you're asking these questions, you're going to level up faster, and that's how you're going to be able to be competent when it comes to a role of, let's say, CEO. Because oftentimes you're like, how can I be CEO? It's all about just consistency, which uh, compiles. Um, I think the big takeaway from this is no matter what your major was, no matter what your interests were academically, it shouldn't define what you do in your life. I'm a biomedical engineer. It has absolutely zero to do with augmented reality and what our company is doing with education. However, I found a new passion and I'm able to apply method methodology of what I learned in my major to this new passion. Um, and that's something that I had to learn was how do you run a business like all these different things about like laws and taxes and accounting and just business mind. Like I never thought I would get into that. Um, and I don't know, look at me now. <laughs> um, I love running the business with Rhea. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and I'm sure she'll tell you, she was a computer science major and has had development. She's able to apply all that stuff, but I'm sure that you've also learned a lot on the, on the road. Yeah. I walked into rain reality. I mean, first of all, I've, we're building on a game platform, and I had never done that before. I never, I played a couple games, but um, now, I mean, Elaine too, we've both learned this entire new platform. We've learned how to code, we've learned all this stuff. The biggest thing is, like, it's okay to not know anything, you just have to be willing to learn. So never say no to something. Always go full face forward. If you don't know something, it's just a great opportunity for you to learn fast. 
Yeah, completely agree. There's always going to be a ton you're going to want to continue to learn. Um, there's a ton of resources out there for you. There's a ton of resources here at Penn State between uh, what Invent Penn State's doing, what the different colleges and campuses are doing. Uh, and definitely I'm going to take the opportunity to plug your alumni network because your alumni network has a lot of great entrepreneurs in there already who have been through it. I know when I first got started, the, one of the first things I did was uh, reach out through my, the Smeal College of Business and ask to be connected to some alumni who had started businesses or who were working in ed tech and every person they introduced me to was more than willing to jump on a call uh, and, and help me uh, through my journey and, and, and let me ask any questions that I had and connect me to resources that they wish they had when they started. So definitely take that as an opportunity as well. So you alluded to it a little bit, uh, but we are here that on television, I don't have TV anymore, that was the first thing that went when I became an entrepreneur, but I hear that entrepreneurship is very glorified in the experience of what being an entrepreneur is. Uh, and as we all kind of uh, mentioned earlier, it's not very much so like that at all. Uh, for every yes that you get, it comes with probably 5,000 no's. So uh, tell us a little bit about how you, how you work through that rejection consistently as, a, as a young entrepreneurs, because um, as an entrepreneur, you end up facing that for a large majority of the journey. We can go. Um, so we pivoted so many times. Um, like I said, we went from health to museums to higher education to K through 12. Um, so there have been a lot of no's that kind of defined that path for us. We realized, first of all, that our inspiration, the Microsoft HoloLens, um, which is a fantastic augmented reality device, was definitely not going to work in schools. Uh, schools are just never going to buy one. It's too expensive. Um, $3,000. So you can't imagine a K through 12 school ever buying that. Um, so there were a lot of no's and no's and no's. And then we fell into this space where, okay, we're starting to hear yeses. We're starting to hear interest. We got our first client with Shavers Creek Nature Preserve. Um, and suddenly things started really falling together. And that's kind of how you know that you're like, you know, you stop failing, you start succeeding. And there are little failures every day, but like you can kind of tell when you're on that that trend of like, you're on your way to something big. I think we're almost getting there. One thing to add, so fail fast. So it's okay to fail. Like we've, we've kept thinking of ideas as soon as we kept failing. <laughs> um, and that's the thing, just pick yourself back up and keep going. And with Shavers Creek, I mean, it's an awesome journey for us to learn how to build a project, for us to learn how to talk to a customer and all of this. So we're getting all these basic skills that we never had before. Yeah, I think that the very beginning, uh, hearing no all the time is really discouraging. And there's times when you hear no so many times, you're like, am I even doing the right thing? I, I shouldn't do this. But keep in mind, like the media, the big giant companies out there, Uber, Airbnb, they got no's, like 99 no's and then one yes. That one yes changed their life. Um, and our personal experience, Kenny and I, we're a social, we have a social company. And so a lot of us, we just, a lot of our time is spent going out there talking to people. And you can show people your app, and then there's some people that are just like, this is stupid. I don't see where, where's the market opportunity. And that stings. But after we got our first investment, the sting doesn't hurt too much anymore. So <laughs> now we, <laughs> we know that there's a real opportunity. And then we also started seeing um, some of the bios that people, because we let you put a little bio on why you want to use the app, tell a little bit about yourself. We, we took time. We have a little bit over 800 users on our platform. We didn't really do anything to, to get that. So the organic growth is also nice. But reading the bios that some people put on there and seeing that people actually care about what we're building means a lot more than hearing 30 no's in person when you see that there's a lot of people that actually do care that are already using it. Yeah, I think some of the great uh, stories around even companies like Twitter and Pinterest, when you, when you hear about uh, the VC's perspectives of the people who passed on them early on of the, and the, the emails that they've saved to the, the founders of those companies where they're just like, I don't get it, I'm going to pass. It makes you really think about uh, kind of where you're starting from and, and where the potential is to grow to. Um, so now we're going to open up if anybody in the audience has any questions. Uh, I can continue to ask questions. I have thousands of them, but I would like to give you guys the opportunity to ask any questions you might have for any of the panelists here. Coming around up front. Sorry, I'm going to make Brad run around a little bit. <laughs> so during the initial stage, like the initial idea stages, was it that you found you had one solid idea that you wanted to pursue, and then you went through sort of market research and then consumer feedback? Or was it that you had sort of just a slew of ideas that maybe you were weighing sort of equally and then you sort of branched it down from there, pruned it down from there?
Uh, so throughout my journey, I've kind of had both ends of that. Um, so early on, it was just ideation stage because I knew I wanted to do something, but I didn't have that idea. So I would kind of just sit down um, and really, really think of you know ideas where I could see um, myself going into. And I, I think that's something very important is to first identify what you're really passionate about. Find what gets you out of bed in the morning, and that's a good place to start. At first, I, was, I didn't do it in the most efficient way, and I would just look for any idea possible, but that, I think, is a really good starting point for ideation. Um, and then I'll let, do you want to jump in with your daily practice? Yeah, I don't know why. And then, that's what popped in my head. And then I'll continue. Uh, just one quick thing before I say that. So when you have co-founders and you, you're really close to your co-founders, <laughs> you don't really complete sentences sometimes. So Kenny and I, we're typically on the same page until we're not. But when we are, we don't even get, <laughs> we don't, it makes a lot more sense. I'm not going to go into detail. But to answer your question, uh, one thing that I did when I knew I wanted to start a company and I was sure that's what I wanted to do, I did this practice where I came up with 10 ideas every single day. And I made it a morning ritual. I, I wouldn't like eat, I wouldn't do anything until I came up with 10 ideas. And you pick a random topic every day, 10 ways, 10 ideas to improve a movie theater can be one thing. And then make the topics harder and harder. And you're gonna push yourself, as soon as you get to seven, it's gonna get hard to get to 10, right? And then as you do that, you become a little bit more creative and you start noticing and looking at things differently. And it makes it a lot easier to look at problems in your daily life and identifying them and coming up with a solution. So um, we came out of 3A Startup with a completely different idea. And the reason why I say pick what you're passionate about is because we came out with a pretty good idea and we had a lot of good feedback. And we started, we continued working on it after that. Um, but we really fizzled out because it was a packaging company and getting out of the bed in the morning, I am not excited at all by mail or packages. So we really kind of got burnt out by that, and Andrew dreaded working on it, and I started to do the same. And that's when we went back to the drawing board and then really refocused on, you know, started with where our passions lie. And for both of us, it was either helping people grow and progress or helping them connect. And that was kind of the birth of someone new and what really fuels us. Uh, I guess I'll, so for me, it was like, uh, Ever since I came to college last year, it was always like, I knew I wanted to do something more than just go to class, uh, write the assignments that were, that were given to me, but I, I didn't know exactly what it was. So what I did was, in my free time, I'd, I'd pick something that I was having trouble with. The first thing I built was a course scheduling thing that helped you uh, decide what to take next semester based on classes that you've taken and pre your prereqs and whatnot. But um, that didn't work out. I wasn't really passionate about scheduling courses, as, as they said. But uh, So I stopped working on it. But I worked on it enough to know that um, I still wanted to keep doing more. So I worked on another product that it was like a vibrating alarm clock when you woke up. But like I went on eBay, and they had like millions of those things uh, on there. So it was like I'd get drowned out. And I really wasn't also passionate about like watches and whatnot. But with, with events, it was something that me and my friends had problems with freshman year. So it was like, uh, not only was it technologically challenging and interesting, it was also something that I really wanted to, to, to get involved with. And, and it's like, because uh, now, like, we spend so much time doing it. If it was just for, for a resume or if it was just something to do on the side, I really wouldn't even be still doing it because it it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of trade-offs that you make with your with your other life but it's um i think the most important thing at least for me is like picking something that you're you're personally having problems with or something that you have personal experience with and then just going in with it diving in because i think ultimately what you'll end up with is not what you started out with you'll probably change a couple of different times but the fact that you'll keep going is probably uh, cor correlates to how passionate you are and how involved you are with the idea to start with. If I had any advice for you, and let's say you had 10 ideas and you're equally passionate about all of them, it'd be to like really focus on one at a time and like 
try to fall in love with it, do all the market research, like spend a week at it, and like you'll realize things here and then you'll be like, okay, maybe that's not. But like it's better to not split up your time among 10 different ideas. It's better to really focus on one until you realize there's more potential with another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, if you, if you have tons of ideas, again, I couldn't drive home any better, but you have to be really passionate about it because the, the years of the no's you'll go through to get those uh, couple yeses, you're going to need that passion to keep, keep you going. Um, and if there's a ton of ideas that you have, definitely take a look at all of them and think about like what are the, the through lines or what are the consistencies, what are the things that I like about them because you can really build one thing really great um, that way. For me, when I was working in corporate America, I was working in data analytics and I loved working in data. Um, but I also love being an engaged alum, and I, I thought it was ridiculous that World Report, when they rank schools, um, you know, and they're looking at you know, student to, to teacher ratios, what they look at on the alumni side is how many alumni give money, and that was it. And so technically, I wasn't contributing to that number at the time for Penn State because I, I w didn't have money to give, but I was coming back all the time. I was doing lots of things. And for me, it was just the problem of like, that's ridiculous that like alumni like me aren't even considered as the value of what this network of education costs. Um, so for me, that was what en enough that drives me to want to prove that out. Any other questions? I'm going to throw in a question real quick yeah. uh, because it, it ties into some of what you were just talking about. I hear I have the privilege of working with a lot of starting entrepreneurs here at, at the university, and one of the things I hear again and again and again is they have an idea, they've got the passion, they've figured out what that thing is. And they know how to start with the business idea, with the startup, but they don't know how to navigate the Penn State system. You've got LaunchBox, Ben Franklin Tech Accelerator, EdTech Network. You've got 1855 Capital, Garber Fund. I could go on mm -hmm. and on and on across the university, SBDC. There's this huge network with a lot of opportunity. How do you start there? How do you start navigating this, or how did you start navigating this? All right, so we started navigating it through, actually, um, I started out at, as an intern for something called Parking Bee, and that's how we found out about LaunchBox, and we applied for their accelerator program. I shortly left Parking Bee after a day, but um, that's how we found out about LaunchBox. But honestly, if you go to LaunchBox, they have open office hours for basically every every department. So you can get help with, um, first of all, making an LLC, figuring out all the law that goes behind all of that. You can get help with finances. You can get help with intellectual property and patents and all of that. Um, you literally can just walk in from 9 to 5. There's usually a lot of um, entrepreneurs working, so you can ask them for help. We're all there at LaunchBox all the time. Um, every day, there's people sitting out um, and hanging out, so that's definitely one of the spaces to go. If you're having trouble, just reach out to people. We've made so many connections within Penn State just because someone was like, okay, you gotta talk to this person, you gotta talk to this person, and it's great. And now we have a huge network of people, decision makers at Penn State, and then people that are just trying to mentor us and help us. And no one's ever said no to helping us or mentoring us, which is absolutely amazing. Yeah, I would definitely agree to go to LaunchBox because I really think starting out, it's about finding that right person who will lead you to the next person. And for me, that was Lee Erickson. Um, in terms of connectedness to entrepreneurship within Penn State, I would say she's number one. And she is now the chief amplifier, I think is her title, at LaunchBox. So just finding that person who's going to take your idea listen to it, and then plug you into the network, I think is key, and she'll be able to do that very well. Yeah, and for me personally, I, I came from a branch campus, and I was still deciding to be a lawyer. That was my goal. Came here junior year, uh, second semester of it, and I joined this club called InnoBlue, and I met this amazing guy named Eli Karif, and he was honestly the, the gatekeeper from me wanting to be a lawyer to me wanting to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I was inspired by him, and he started connecting me with people, and he was just the genuine caring. The community of Inno Blue, all these entrepreneurs, some of them generating revenue, some of them just having ideas, but every single one of them willing to sit down with you, and you could see the passion in their eyes and the fact that they felt fulfilled by creating something. And literally, I said this before, I'll say it again, anyone up here is more than happy to take the time. And if you're in this room right now and you're 
you're in that, that phase, they, you go literally right out there and make a left, and all these people that know everything about the connections here at Penn State are right there. So if you're in this room right now, go there after you leave here. Great, we have another question. When you guys moved past your uh, beta phase into like your final design, did you take the time to teach yourself to code for like back end, front end coding, or did you kind of outsource that? Because I'm that's my problem right now is like I have an idea, but I like kind of the coding is what's holding me up because I can invest my time into learning how to code, but that just I'm, I just don't know what to do. I'll start. Um, so I think that's a perfect question for Andrew and myself because Andrew is the least technical person I know, <laughs> and that's not an insult, he knows it, he knows his strengths. <laughs> um, whereas I'm an IST, so I do have somewhat of a technical background, but, and I was kind of at a crossroads. Do I jump into it, do I become the CTO, um, or do I find somebody else? And we ultimately went with the decision to find somebody else, because when I was introspective and I looked at myself, I knew I could probably do it, but I would have to put way too much time in, and I wouldn't be the best person. Um, so then we found somebody, and we found them through the launch box, actually. Um, and we also found them through, essentially, our platform, which is just going around and talking to people. So the more connected you are, the more events you go to, the more people you talk to, uh, your chances are going to be better if you go to you know, the computer science building, stuff like that. You just go out and you look for that technical person and maybe you are that technical person and that's something you have to ask yourself and see what you want to do down the road. Do you see yourself you know, programming for the foreseeable future or is that just a stepping stone or would you rather pass that on to somebody else? Um, and just something, a practical thing that you can do tomorrow. Uh, look at, there's, I think every Thursday there's this thing called Hacky Hour uh, look up this person on Facebook named Christina Platt. They have a developer network. You can reach out to there, start there. And then outside of that, there's these things called hackathons. I went to a hackathon with zero ability to code. I didn't even care to learn. And I went to a thing where there was literally people programming for 24 hours, and I didn't even, I didn't even attempt to code at all. I was going there to scout, right? So you have to figure out these places where programmers live, and if you know that's not your strong suit, double down on what your strengths are and then make it happen. So yeah, we also um, decided that bring. Oh, sorry. We wanted to bring other people onto the team who had the skills that we didn't have. Um, we had computer science, but she just didn't have some of the skills that we needed. We didn't really know how to use Unity. We kind of wanted someone to help us guide us through that. So what we did was we made a bunch of these little flyers that like said, uh, like, do you want to join a really cool startup? Like, please contact us at rainreality at outlook.com. And we went to a couple of Rio's comp side classes and just handed out like hundreds of these little flyers. And that's how we got our like favorite developer, um, <laughs> Kosho. And he's amazing. And he's been with, been with us since that day. Um, and one of our big goals is to be, eventually be able to actually hire him full time. So it, if you don't know how to do something, I, you can try to learn it. But like, I think there's other people at Penn State. Developer network here is amazing. Like, go to the comp site classes. Go to the hackathons. Recruit people for your team. Because it's also a really good idea to have people to bounce your ideas off of. Yeah, I mean, when I started my company, I have a business background. I had no coding experience whatsoever. Um, I found a technical co-founder. Uh, I am a self-taught developer, so I took a lot of weekends, like 24-hour, 48-hour classes to learn different languages. Um, but I don't, I have a whole team of developers now, so I don't do as much in the code anymore. Uh, and now they kick me out of it most of the time when I'm in there. Uh, but I do, from time to time, for me, it was really important as a founder to really understand our technical stack and how, how the different technologies spoke to each other. We're dealing with a lot of you know, different mobile technologies. Uh, everything speaks through a custom built API that then speaks to our software as a service platform that's written in a couple different languages. So it was really important for me to be able to understand that to not only know what was possible from, a, from feature requests and things that way, but also when speaking to investors uh, around uh, the scalability of our technology. Um, so it's definitely a good skill to have really good basic knowledge of it. I learned, again, from going to meetups and things like that. What I always tell uh, business students here who have really good ideas is just walk over to IST or walk into computer labs, and if you see somebody who's got code up on their screen, just like tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, what are you working on? Uh, and then tell them about your idea, and if you can find somebody who's 
would be passionate about that idea too. It, it, uh, having a co-founder is definitely um, something that's really important for when you're starting up your company. And it's something a, a lot of investors won't invest in companies that don't have two uh, co-founders. Uh, sole founders are not as a attractive opportunity for investors because they see them not as, as successful as often. So um, don't be willing to you know, give up some ownership and create a partnership. It's a lot like dating. It's uh, like you're, they're going to be your new significant other. As you can see, with these uh, some of the co-founders up here, they have very tight relationships. It's kind of a, a funny thing to experience, but uh, it's definitely worth you know, walking around campus here because there's a ton of them around. One more. one more thing really fast. So uh, Kenny and I decided that one day we needed an iOS developer. Like we needed one bad. So what we did was we dedicated a day towards it. So we literally walked around campus, walked in the hub, walked in the IST building. We found two developers that day by manually just walking up to people. I was going to anybody who had an Apple computer and said, hey, do you, do you program? <laughs> if in and out situation, right? It's like you figure out what your, your pain points are and how much you're willing to fight for it. Any other questions from the audience? So uh, after you released your MVP out to the world, at what point did you um, basically like, receive enough validation to understand that what you had was something good and something worth pursuing? So we went through a couple iterations of that MVP. Um, so we tried to take it a step further every time. Um, and we probably asked and talked to almost 800 people, close to 1,000 before we started any code. Um, but I would say around the 100, 200 mark of you know, validation, that's when we kind of started really looking for a technical person and decided an app would be the best uh, way to uh, you know, create a solution for our problem. Uh, for, for us, it was, it was a little bit different because uh, I'd already built the website and then I was like, so what do I do with this? So uh, I, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. So I just went to the hub and I started talking to people. Uh, I had this idea in my head that I'd just talk to 100 people and then they'd tell like a thousand of their friends and I'd be on Forbes like the next week. But <laughs> it didn't, didn't exactly work out that way. But, <laughs> uh, but we... Because of uh, just us talking to people without any, we weren't at the launch box at that point. We, we were just kind of doing, it was just me and my friend uh, or my co-founder, I guess. It was just me and him and we just go out and talk to people. But we got 100 people on the website over the summer. There was basically no one here, but we started using it just for us sharing events with each other. And uh, at the beginning, no one would, we'd, we'd get them to sign up, but no one would return. And it was like, all right, so what are we doing wrong? Cause if no one's returning, then we might as well stop now. But we found out what, what the problem was. We fixed it. Then we we saw that number going up by two people every week, and it was like, all right, two out of 100, 2%, not too bad. But how do we get it to? So that was kind of like just our whole uh, thinking process. I mean, right now we're still we're we're still at the at the beginning stages. We we released our apps earlier this semester. We got 1,200 people on it, but we're still at the point where how do we increase the user engagement? How do we get more people to, to really love us and not just to like, you know, users once in a while? And so that's kind of like our whole goal at the moment. But I'd say like just getting those numbers up, just talking to people, understanding why they're not coming back as often is really important because if, if they don't love you, then even if you get a million people on your platform and no one returns, there's really no point to it. Yeah, I think the, the big step is really once you know what market you're going after, think about the different use cases in that market and what, who are the different uh, user personas that would end up using your product and, and try to get validation from as many of those as you can get. So for us, uh, we were working specifically in alumni relations departments and uh, a lot of the ideas came out of this meal college business. So we talked with them a lot around what they needed and what their pain points were. And if we built something like this, would they buy it? And they were like, yeah, we definitely need something like this. And then we thought about, all right, well, what are, what are other problems that uh, maybe schools that don't have an affinity like Penn State has uh, with their alumni network and sports that drives that and all these other great things. So we went to some smaller schools and had those same conversations. And uh, we went to private schools, public schools, liberal arts school, and had those conversations with people to really understand uh, what the pain points were. People who 
only focused on alumni engagement, people who had multiple roles with engagement and fundraising, uh, people who had roles in just career services. And so just really understanding who are all the different potential customers and, and how, how much of the market we could actually go after. Any other questions? I think we have time for about one or two more. So this has been great so far. What, what came to my mind just now are, are three Ps, and this may have been, it may be written somewhere, but I'll just share them. So passion, persevere, and pivot. So you gotta have passion in order to persevere, but sometimes to persevere you have to pivot, right? But I wanna go back to the beginning, and this was touched on a little bit, the passion part. And, and this may be a little harder question than you might, might think or, or initially, but what passion drives each one of you? What's the core passion that's, that mm -hmm. has you up on that uh, stage today? Yeah, so I, I guess I can do a shameless plug here before I, I completely answer your question. So when we first started our company, um, I decided that I wanted to document our journey and I didn't have a camera at that time. I have Taylor right there recording for me because I have my own vlog. So it's called Asymp Vlogs. Google someone new and you'll find us. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, the reason why, the thing that drives me, the thing that I want to do is what we're doing right now, but at scale, right? So I want to be able, I don't know if any of you guys know who Gary Vaynerchuk is. He's someone who really drives me and I, that's where I want to be when I'm in my 40s. I want to be able to show people, imagine if Mark Zuckerberg, when he first started Facebook, he started recording the process. Imagine how many people would want to watch him from the very beginning of his journey rather than watching a documentary or a fake movie. So instead of doing that, being able to physically see what happened in certain days leading up to it is what drives me. So my passion is to be able to inspire people to be able to go after what they want because I wish that I had someone to directly do that when I was younger or when I wanted to first start being an entrepreneur, I wish I had someone directly to kind of emulate until I found myself. So I want to be able to be that North Star, I guess, for someone's direction. For me, I think my passion really is progress. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, not many people know this, but when I was younger, up until about the age of 12, I was what people call a selective mute. So I was very, very shy, very quiet, very introverted. Um, I still sometimes am those things, but at that time, I would not talk. Um, my brother would talk for me or my dad, and my dad was referred to as the mayor because he would go to a room of people and similar to Andrew, he can engage with them very easily. And um, up until about age of 12, I just didn't really talk for myself. It was very selectively when I talked. And as I got in more interested in business and entrepreneurship, I really saw the importance of communication. And I really pushed myself out of my comfort zone. Um, one example is knocking doors with Andrew, just going up to random uh, people's homes and asking them if they would try out our, our uh, product and that scared the living hell out of me because of you know my past. Uh, but that thrill and what came of that really excites me and, and being able to, like I said before, level up faster than kind of other people is really what drives me. And then uh, with progress, I think, ties in my other passion, which is communication. So coming from a background of not being able to communicate, and then, you know, up to this point, I think I'm doing a lot better than I had previously. Um, it goes together, it ties into the progress, but I really think that is essential to, you know, who we are as humans is being able to converse and talk to each other and engage. So those are really my two uh, passions. So um, I guess what gets me up in the morning is that we are going to change, hopefully, in the future, like how people think about education. So right now, education feels really linear, like you have to memorize these things and you get a grade out of it. Well, throughout education, I never liked that. And my grades have reflect reflected just that, but they've also, in a way, they've never reflected what I actually know and what I actually can do. So I feel like augmented reality, when you can specifically apply these things to, I don't know, your learning, um, that would have changed my life when I was younger. So I see myself like people just like me who are probably really smart, but just kind of hid away in the corner from everyone else because they thought they weren't. I thought for so long that I wasn't smart <laughs> for so long, but um, that's not the case. 
For me, I think my passion is I when I wake up in the morning, I when I go to work on Rain Reality, I realize like I really want to help people be better versions of themselves. I really want to enable people to do things on their own. I don't want to be um, just doing things for them. And what we started off was we were a service company, so we were making apps for different clients, different um, nature preserves and whatnot. But I realized like it'd be so much cooler and better if they could do it themselves, or they could use a tool to make an augmented reality learning mo module all on their own. And I think that's so much more powerful than doing it for them. Um, I think enabling people to kind of create their own product in a way. I think about Weebly, like Weebly basically transformed how we think about websites. And before you had to hire someone to make a website for you, but now people can easily just drag things onto their little canvas and make something powerful. And I think that's so much better. And I just love being a part of that movement of helping people to be better versions of themselves. Uh, for me, it's um, the thing that drives me most is doing something that makes a difference. I mean, it's probably a cliche, but I've always wanted to do something big and not just graduate, get a job, uh, be a middle manager at some company. I mean, that's completely fine for some people and it, they're, they're happy doing it, but for me, it's always, I've always wanted to do something that had an impact. And I think with entrepreneurship, um, now that I've seen, like, uh, I, I hear stories and I see people, like everyone up here, you know, living their, their dream and, and doing something that, like, it's probably terrifying at the beginning, but they've stuck with it. They put insane hours into it. But th they're doing it because they believe that uh, ultimately they'll, they'll make a difference in the world uh, in some small way or in some huge way as probably everyone wants to. And so that's, that's the thing that drives me and, and that's the reason I wake up every morning and work on, on, on our startup because we see that even in a small way, people finding their community. Like I didn't know that I would, I would fall into the, into the entrepreneurship community, but I've met some of my, my closest friends because they're doing something similar and we can relate to. So it's like everyone has different interests, but ultimately, uh, your closest friends are the people who share some of those interests, and sometimes it's hard to meet those people. But for us, we're hoping that what's po with what's popping, we can connect you to your community through events. And even if we we're, we only help ten people uh, throughout our time, I think that would be <laughs> worth it for me because we, we've we've touched a life, even though it might be in a small way. But yeah. And for me, it's, there's been a lot of little things over time that have helped fuel that fire, but originally the passion coming from just wanting to show the, the, and bring to the masses the really unique experience I was having as an alum and, and staying engaged and staying connected and make that accessible to anybody uh, who, wherever they went after graduation. Uh, and then after working hands-on with the teams here as an alumni volunteer, the people who are doing alumni relations, seeing that they wanted to be doing that too and they just didn't have the tool set to do it effectively. Um, was really painful to see at first and then and really wanted me to want to help. Uh, and then my experience as an alum during that time, I know that there's a story I tell that I know you've heard too at the jokes I make around. Uh, I was coming back to campus so frequently, I was probably one of the most engaged alum, but I kept getting mail from me and my husband with the mailing addresses asking for money and I had never been married. Uh, the person, it wasn't even my husband. And it just it bothered me that the, the technology wasn't there to even have updated information on me when I was somebody who was being so engaged. So there are little instances like that have, that have really helped fuel the fire and, and wanting to make a change in, in how we look at the alumni network and the alumni space. So that's all the time we have for this session. We thank everybody for coming. Thank the panelists here today for uh, sharing us their stories. And please help me thank Melissa.